I, I, want to, uh, I want to talk a little bit about what happens in the Civil War, because, you know, Reconstruction does not come out of nowhere, so to speak. Um, one of the things in the old view of Reconstruction one of the, was that it, it sort of was seen as this utter aberration. It had no antecedents and no uh, legacy. It was just this weird, bizarre moment, whereas, of course, not, no period of history is like that. Everything has antecedents and everything has consequences. One can, as I said, trace it back before the Civil War. Um, Stephen Hahn, a very good scholar at uh, uh, Penn, University of Pennsylvania, wrote a book a few years ago, uh, won the Pulitzer Prize, a very good book called um, A Nation Under Our Feet, in which he wrote about, he wrote an interesting chapter about the politics of slaves. We tend not to think about slaves in connection with politics. There's a lot of work on slave religion, slave culture, slave family life. What kind of political ideas did slaves have? Now he's using politics in a very broad sense, not just who's getting elected, but how should society be organized, how power should be. What about slavery itself? And he argued strongly that slaves had political ideas and that the black activism that we will see in Reconstruction has its roots in slavery. It, again, it doesn't just pop out of nowhere. And many of the actions and ideas we will talk about starting tomorrow, you have to trace back into the politics of slaves. Now, doing that is not so easy because the sources for slaves' ideas are obviously not so simple to get at. But nonetheless, um, and, and as Martha Jones just was telling us an hour or so ago, the struggle for rights among black people was going on before the Civil War. The struggle to be, to use whatever pieces of citizenship they could grab hold of for their own purposes does not just come out of Reconstruction. So <laughs> there are <laughs> antecedents in the black community, in the slave community. Whoops, I, forgot, I gotta put this on, right? There are antecedents in the abolitionist movement, the radical Republicans who sort of represent abolitionism in Congress. And, um, but it's in the Civil War that this, these things really come to the fore. Now, one could have a whole seminar on the Civil War, and maybe we will one of these days. But what I, what I want to emphasize is how, two things, basically. One, how from the very beginning of the Civil War, the actions of slaves, as well as many other people, put the question of emancipation on the national agenda. Why does the Civil War result in the destruction of slavery? Or, to put it in a more colloquial way, which is starring as a bit, who freed the slaves? That's one of those bad questions that will inevitably get a bad answer, since it's a bad question. Or, to put it another way, uh, in the lingo of historians, we have our own vocabulary, the, the destruction of slavery was overdetermined, which is just another way of saying it had a lot of causes. There's a lot of people who freed the slaves, and a lot of reasons slavery was, and there's no one answer. There's a lot of answers. It's the whole conglomeration of people and circumstances and all sorts of things. But from the very beginning of the war, this is, gets on to the national agenda, even though, as you know, Lincoln says at the beginning, the war is to preserve the Union, not to free the slaves. Slaves start running away to Union lines as soon as they're able to, as soon as the Union army begins to penetrate into the Confederacy. Um, not only before the Civil War, slaves ran away, some of them, not that many. Before the Civil War, it was mostly young men who ran away. It was very difficult to run away from the South. It was a pretty arduous thing to run away from the South to the North. I mean, there were women, uh, Harriet Tubman, the great leader of the Underground Railroad, <laughs> led groups of slaves out. But your typical runaway before the Civil War was a young, unattached man. If you were a woman with children, it was pretty difficult to run away from slavery, um, although some did. But as soon as the Civil War breaks out, families start running away because they're running to Union lines. They're running to forts. It's closer. It's easier. And this puts the question right on the national agenda very quickly. What are we going to do with these people some Union generals start returning them. Some say, we're not going to return them. We're going to keep them. Um, I don't want to give the whole chronology of emancipation, because that's a whole other subject. But the real point is, and this is how I begin my book, that once the Lincoln administration decides, for numerous reasons, that the destruction of slavery must become a war, a part of the war, a measure of the war, uh, that 
opens the question of Reconstruction uh, immediately. It says, what is going to be the status of these people once they are free? And more than that, what kind of society is going to take the place of slavery? Because slavery is a total society. It is, it is a system of labor to begin with. It is a system of race relations. It is a system of power among whites. It gives some power, great power to some whites and very little power to other whites. It's a political system. Slavery is a total system, and the destruction of slavery means a new, total, a new system has to be created in the South, a new racial system, a new labor system, a new political system, a new set of relations between blacks and whites and among blacks and among whites. All those things are going to have to be revamped if the institution of slavery is destroyed by the Civil War. And that, in a sense, is what Reconstruction is. Reconstruction is not just, as it used to be uh, mostly called, the reuniting of the nation, although that is, of course, very important, on what terms, on what conditions are, are the southern seceding states, the defeated Confederacy, to come back into the Union? Who will rule the South? What rights will people have? Etc. What kind of society and what will be the status of these four million people who were slaves until the uh, beginning of the Civil War? So, so much of that's going to be on an interpersonal level, though. And at one point in your book, you talk about the mechanism that didn't exist uh, for, for this to really happen, even if there was a. Well, you know, it, 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 it's at all levels at the same time. Obviously, the, per, the interpersonal level, I think I, I use the phrase somewhere in my book, the politicization of everyday life. Every, and we'll talk about this more tomorrow. Every encounter becomes a fraud with, you know, everybody knew how slaves were supposed to behave. They didn't always behave that way, but there was a whole etiquette and set of laws of how sla slaves knew how they were supposed to act in the presence of white people. And white people knew how slaves were supposed to act, but nobody knew how former slaves were supposed to act and former owners. In fact, Where's that book uh, floating around, uh, the book of uh, the exhibit? I don't know. It must be around somewhere. If we ever find it, I want to show you the painting by Winslow Homer, uh, Visit from the Old Mistress, which is this wonderful painting of a couple of female slaves and the old mistress, the woman. And the, the tension in that painting is so palpable, it's remarkable. Just that nothing is happening. They're just standing there. But it, it, it makes you a point about the interpersonal, the difficulty of interpersonal relations in this moment of transition from slavery to freedom. But, um, but we do get to the question, and I want to just talk a minute about what, what did, you know, what did Lincoln, what was Lincoln's plan of reconstruction? Because that's a critical part of the whole mythology of reconstruction, that Lincoln had this plan, Andrew Johnson tried to implement it after Lincoln's death, and um, was foiled. The first thing, and this is the theme of my book, is that there is no such thing as Lincoln's idea about almost anything. In other words, the critical thing about Lincoln is his evolution, his capacity for change, his open-mindedness, and, and I try to locate him within the context of the broad anti-slavery movement, which stretches from abolitionists at one end to more moderate people. Lincoln hated slavery, there's no question about that, but he was not an abolitionist. He never claimed to be an abolitionist. And to ask why he wasn't an abolitionist is absurd, because he, he's not an abolitionist. He's a politician, and that's a different role in society. And then there are people much more conservative than Lincoln who are still anti-slavery. Lincoln occupies different positions on that spectrum during the course of the Civil War. But, one, but he has this open-mindedness and willingness to listen to criticism and to change. Every single major initiative of Lincoln's on this front, starting before the Civil War, refusal to compromise during the secession winter, um, uh, raising the issue of emancipation early in the war, as he does in 1861, um, Emancipation, uncompensated emancipation, remember the property right destroyed by the Emancipation Proclamation, putting blacks into the Union Army, 
by the end of his life talking about some black men uh, enjoying the right to vote. Every one of those was a position first demanded by abolitionists and which Lincoln moves toward. It's not he moves toward it just because he says, hey, these abolitionists are saying it, I got to do it. He's part of a spectrum of opinion in a crisis moment where the willingness to grow and change is the essence of leadership. That's what his successor, Andrew Johnson, completely lacked. The ability to think anew, as Lincoln said in one of his brilliant speeches, you know, 1862, we must, uh, you know, we must disenthrall ourselves. What an unusual word, you know. This is a guy who had one year of formal schooling in his entire life. Makes you wonder if our job is even needed. <laughs> he, and yet had a command of the English language, probably second only to Jefferson's among all the presidents. The only time, and it, of course all this stuff, is, the only time I ever used this word, what an unusual word, we must disenthrall ourselves. We are enthralled, we are tied down, we are imprisoned by what? By old ideas. Not literally speaking, by old ideas. The only way to save our nation, he said, is to think anew. And Lincoln is willing to do that. Andrew Johnson is never willing to do that. But the point is, for Lincoln, Reconstruction is part of the Civil War. It is not a, he never outlines a blueprint or a plan, really. He does come forward with what they call, and you said this, this 10% plan, 18, end of 1863. It's an offer to white people in the South. If you say you're going to come back into the Union and accept the end of slavery, in other words, you, you can't just say, I'm loyal to the Union. Now, once the Emancipation Proclamation has been issued, you also have to accept the end of slavery. If you're, if you're willing to do that, if you accept the Union and you accept the end of slavery, then you'll have all your rights given back. There's not going to be any punishment except the very, very top leaders, um, except for your loss of slaves. You're not going to get your slaves back. Um, and you'll get back the right to vote. And when 10% of the voters from 1860, which of course is all whites, will take such an oath, they can then create a new government in the South. Now, sure, this is very lenient, 10%, what's that? A few thousand people in some states. But the point is, this is an effort to detach states from the Confederacy. If you can get a state to detach itself from the Confederacy and rejoin the Union, that's worth more than any military victory on a battlefield. And he's particularly interested in Louisiana, where there is a significant pro-Union sentiment in the uh, New Orleans and uh, surrounding areas. Um, so this is an effort to win the war. It's not a blueprint for what's going to happen after the war. And by the way, other Reconstruction plans go on during the Civil War, and Lincoln says, fine. In, he appoints Andrew Johnson military governor of Tennessee. He's got his lenient 10% plan going on in Louisiana, but Johnson says, forget this. I don't want these, no, no, you gotta take a much bigger oath than that. You gotta take an oath that you never supported the Confederacy. Then I'll let you back in. Well, that excludes almost everybody. So, whites in Tennessee complained to Lincoln, this is not your plan. And Lincoln said, well, Johnson knows what's going on. Let him, I don't care if he wants to do that in Tennessee, that's all right with me. Uh, you know, he's in charge. So he lets different plans go along in different places. There's another plan going on in Arkansas. Um, of Reconstruction. So there's different Reconstructions going on during the Civil War. The idea that Lincoln had a single plan is really not correct. Nobody knows what Lincoln would have done, obviously, had he not been killed. But we do know that in his last speech, now we call it his last speech, it was his last speech. He didn't know it was his last speech, right? So we, it's not a final summation of it. He's not saying this is the, uh, no, this is the speech. I'm going to get shot two days later. So it's his last speech. But um, his last speech, which was carefully worked out, it was given on the portico of the White House to a crowd that had assembled. And he invited Charles Sumner, the great abolitionist senator, the most prominent advocate of black rights in the Senate, to stand on the platform with him. He wanted Sumner to be there to, again, to show his um, interest in uniting the Republican Party. 
Sumner was actually a big pal of Lincoln's, partly because he was a very cultivated guy and he liked the theater. And Lincoln didn't like to go to the theater that much. His wife loved to go to the theater, and he's always sending Sumner these notes. Would you like to go to the theater with my wife tonight? I'm busy with the war. Yeah. It's unfortunate that on uh, April 14, 1865, he didn't tell Sumner. Anyway. Um, so in this speech, Lincoln says, look, the war is almost over. It, by this point, it's just about over. Um, Reconstruction is going on. I've got a government which was set up under the 10% plan in uh, Louisiana. Some people don't like it because f blacks can't vote. Blacks can't vote. Only whites can vote. Now, in New Orleans, and Professor Jones knows a lot more about New Orleans than I do, but there is a significant free black community which goes back to the days of the French and the Spanish and has unique rights within the United States. They have certain rights which free blacks don't have in other places because of the treaty of annexation, of, of purchase of Louisiana. Thanks to Napoleon Bonaparte or his negotiators, free blacks in New Orleans have more rights because they can't have their rights taken away. It's in that treaty once it becomes part of the United States. So um, anyway, they're property, many of them. They're well-educated. They're very politically engaged and active. And they've been agitating for the right to vote right through the Civil War. They sent a delegation up to Washington. Two of them meet with Lincoln, talk to him about it. In 1864, after meeting that delegation, Lincoln sends a note to the governor of, Lu of, of Louisiana, the Unionist governor, saying, yeah, why don't you let these guys vote in the new Constitution? But what's interesting is they come up and they say to Lincoln, you should let the free blacks vote. We are, and there's no, they're just as qualified as anybody, obviously, to vote. When Lincoln sends his letter to the governor of Louisiana, he says, why don't you, I'm privately suggesting, let in the very intelligent, that's these free blacks, and those who serve nobly in our ranks. That's the soldiers. By, by the end of the war, the Emancipation Proclamation is what really opens the door to black enlistment in the army. <laughs> by the end of the war, 200,000 black men have served in the Union Army and Navy. It is, my view, it is black military service which puts the question of black citizenship on the national agenda. Fighting and dying for the Union gives you a claim to a role in the post-war world. And this is not unique to the Civil War. Many wars in American history have led to the expansion of rights. The Women's Suffrage Amendment comes in during World War uh, I. The right to vote for 18-year-olds comes in during the uh, Vietnam War. Um, it, it, is, it is the service of black soldiers more than anything else which begins to change racial views in the North as, which will lead into Reconstruction. And in Lincoln's, Lincoln is tremendously impressed, and it changes Lincoln's views, the service of black soldiers. At, at a certain point in 1864, when the presidential election is coming up, and a lot of people think Lincoln is going to lose, uh, Henry J. Raymond, the head of the Republican National Committee, goes down to Washington to Lincoln, look, Lincoln, you're going to lose. People are, think the war is being extended just because of the Emancipation Proclamation. Why don't you say, if they'll come back, they can keep their slavery. We'll rescind the Emancipation, they, they can't, you know, put the onus on the South. And then if they say no, at least we'll know it's their fault, but people will then re say it's not just emancipation which is delaying peace. Lincoln says, ah, no, I can't do that, I can't do that. Because if I say that, we have 200,000 black men in the army. They've been promised freedom. What are we going to do? We're going to take away the promise of freedom? We would lose, if they, and why should they fight if we do that? And if they don't fight, we can't win the war. In other words, Lincoln has come to the conclusion that the service of these black men is indispensable to winning the war and preserving the Union. So he will, even at the cost of possibly losing the presidential election, he is not willing to go back on that principle. So in his last speech in 1865, for the first time publicly, he says, as to Louisiana, uh, 
some people, some people complain that black people don't have the right to vote. Then he says something very interesting, a sentence which is never really picked up out of this. It's on my mind because I just have this book finished. He says, the black man wants the vote. He acknowledges that black people want the right to vote. He has never said that in his entire life. They have volition in this also. It's not just white people making decisions for them. They want the right to vote. And he says, I now would prefer that the right to vote were given to the very intelligent and the soldiers. Now, that's not universal male suffrage, obviously. But this, at this moment, who can tell me how many states in the Union allow black men to vote when Lincoln is giving that speech? I think it's six, actually. I think it's five states in New England and New York, which had such a high property qualification for them that very few could. But the vast majority of the northern states do not allow blacks to vote at that time, not to mention the southern states. So this is actually a rather forward-looking proposal by Lincoln in his last speech. So what is my point? My point is that Lincoln is a man who changes. So we have no idea what would have happened if Lincoln had not been shot. The 10% plan should not be viewed as a hard and fast set of principles. Indeed, at his last cabinet meeting, the day of his assassination, we know from the diary of um, uh, Gideon Wells, the Secretary of the Navy, Lincoln says, we got to talk about Reconstruction now, and you know, maybe I've been a little too quick in it, and he says, I want Stanton to come up with a order, a military order to get this process of reconstruction going and we'll start discussing it. So it's just something that's now on the agenda and then Lincoln is assassinated. So when the Civil War ends, when Lincoln's life ends, the question of reconstruction is unresolved, totally unresolved. It's up in the air. There is no, Congress has not passed any laws. They passed one, the Wade Davis bill, which Lincoln vetoed because it was an attempt to get around his 10% plan. Um, Congress has never recognized the government of Louisiana, which Lincoln has established. So it's, it's, and it's all put off to the next meeting of Congress, which won't be till the following December. So when Andrew Johnson comes in, which is where we'll start next, <coughs> next time, there's a lot of different views about what should happen out there, but there is no set principle or policy whatsoever. But these very, very difficult questions about land, labor, um, uh, politics, social life, personal life, they're all citizenship, etc. They're all just out there on the agenda when the Reconstruction, as most people define it, starting in 1865, begins. I'm going to actually stop there because I do want to leave. We have a good bit of time.